Apparently, the events unfold at a construction site, where one of the workers is showing something to the concrete mixer driver. Then we hear a conversation between the man who appears to be the main character. He is asked why he is not picking up the phone. He explains that he is in a noisy place and therefore did not hear the call. He calls the person he is talking to his brother. The main character also wonders why his brother called him. He is told that he does not need a reason to call his brother. Then we see the brother of the main character, who is apparently in the office in a formal suit. He says he wants to meet the main character. The protagonist replies that apparently today will not be possible, as he is busy. The brother asks what he is busy with. Then we hear the words of the protagonist's assistant, who tells the workers to be more careful. The hero's assistant becomes angry at the workers because they are doing everything wrong. He points out that the pouring should have been done differently. One of the guys says that they accidentally discovered the corpses of military men they wanted to pour concrete over. The scene then returns to the main character's conversation with his brother. The brother asks if the protagonist is coming today or not. After that, someone rumbles out the door, apparently being thrown. Now we see a pumped up man swearing at the South Koreans, that is, our heroes. This man is introduced as a member of the North Korean Task Force 525 named Lee Young Chul. The protagonist tells his brother that he will come later. Then the boy asks the man lying on the floor with the knife wound how he is feeling, calling him a rookie. The boy replies that he is fine, for the wound is not deep. The main character then realizes the need to stop the bleeding and removes his work suit, revealing his military camouflage uniform. Now we are introduced to the main character named Becky Su, a special NR unit commander in North Korea. He has four years of experience infiltrating North Korea and a total of 12 infiltrations. An outsider asks how long it takes a North Korean military man to fight Becky Su. One person says that he will only last 10 seconds, but another person objects, saying that the military man needs to last at least 30 seconds. Then the enemy starts attacking with a knife, but the protagonist easily dodges the blows. The commander elbows his opponent hard on the chin and finishes him off with a punch to the face, as if driving him into the ground, which obviously results in the instant death of the enemy. After that, the main character puts his work uniform back on. He indicates that the other military personnel take care of the newcomer and put the place in order. He also informs them that he will go first. A dead military man is placed on a wagon. The protagonist tells us that this is why he doesn't tell anyone what he does, because the easiest thing to say is that he has a black job. The scene moves to a restaurant. The main character walks forward, but is stopped by an employee of the restaurant. He tells him that all the seats are booked. The protagonist replies that he has an appointment. But the employee says that basic etiquette is required in their restaurant, and the protagonist's work uniform does not conform to the dress code. Then the hero's brother turns to him. He asks why he is just standing there without telling the worker that he has a meeting with his brother. The brother approaches the hero and the worker and asks if something might be wrong, and adds that it's probably okay. The worker apologizes, saying that he did not know that the protagonist is his guest. The protagonist assures that all is well, and that it is time to go, continuing to move forward. The brother notices a sign on the hero's uniform stating that safety is paramount. The brother likes it. The scene returns to the military at the construction site, where, apparently, some kind of recreation is taking place. They are sitting at tables. One of the workers angrily says that this is their first party in three months, and they've only gotten frozen pork. This makes him furious. One of the soldiers replies that the commander told them to wait, and assumes that the commander will bring something with him on the way. The other soldier, chewing, says that he likes everything, since they haven't eaten meat in a long time. They also advise the newcomer to eat more, since he has been hurt. The man who was annoyed says that he should have gone after the commander. He is sure that the commander is enjoying something delicious. Then black vans pull up to the military and a man gets out of one of them. They say welcome to him, calling him chief. It is probably the crew chief, as one of the military men says that they started eating and drinking without him and apologizes. The chief apologizes for leaving because he had a project to complete. He continues his monologue, saying that he has something to say. Suddenly he interrupts and says he doesn't see Commander Becky Sue. The military responds that he left early for personal reasons. 
The chief says it makes his job harder by sticking his hand in his jacket and pulling something out. One of the guys doesn't understand what kind of job the commander is doing, and before he can finish his sentence, he gets shot in the forehead by the warden. The chief announces that today they are disbanding a small special unit. After that, other military men come out of the vans with combat weapons. The military lines up and points their guns at the workers. The chief orders the military not to let anyone through and, reloading his gun, says with a threatening look that the guys have done a good job. Events then return to the main character and his brother. They are sitting at a table in a restaurant, with a picturesque view of the city. There is wine and expensive food on the table. The commander's brother offers to work together, handing him a business card. He also asks why the soldier is wearing a work uniform. The hero replies that in this way he supports the population. The brother asks if the soldiers help the civilians. The brother continues his monologue, saying that he can't watch himself making a lot of money and his brother working for pennies. He says there is nothing difficult about the job, he just has to manage some restaurants. The commander answers nothing, and his brother calls out to him, asking if he is listening. The guy replies that he will think about it. Then the commander's phone starts ringing. Someone calls him, and he tells his brother that he needs to step away. He goes to the bathroom. The interlocutor asks if the protagonist liked the expensive food. The commander immediately realizes that it is Shehi. He asks what's wrong with his voice. Shehi starts joking, saying that they ate something yummy without the commander. He ate too much and got sick. The commander orders Sher Ong not to joke around and tells him what's going on. The wounded guy says that Chief Shang has betrayed them. The commander tells him to hold out a little longer, for he will be arriving soon. He is told to run, for these men are already looking for him. Then the hero starts shouting, Sher On. Lee Sher Him. And the phone conversation is interrupted. Now we see the soldier enter the restaurant. The worker informs the soldier that all seats are taken but before he can finish his sentence, his throat is cut. Then we see the brother taking a little nap, leaning against the table. He hears someone approach and ask if his brother is back, addressing him as you, assuming it is his brother. When he opens his eyes, however, he sees three soldiers with knives in front of him, approaching with a threatening look. Then we see the main character running out of the bathroom, but he is met by a group of soldiers with knives. One of the soldiers tells someone that Becky Sue is in front of them, and they proceed to eliminate him. A fight ensues. One of the soldiers launches his attack, but the protagonist easily parries his attack, retrieves the knife and deals with the first enemy. Then he faces the second one, dealing with him just as easily. The protagonist notices that this soldier's movements are too predictable. He then removes his work uniform, points the knife at his opponents and invites them to attack again. The villains decide to attack in threes. The hero fights his enemies at knives, deftly parrying their attacks. However, one of the soldiers still strikes him and cuts his shoulder. Suddenly a fourth soldier appears and attacks from behind. The scene shifts to the traitor-in-chief. One of his assistants reports that they are finished here. The chief asks what about Becky Sue. The aide replies that one special unit is busy with him right now, and they'll report back soon. Smoking a cigarette, the chief says that one squad will not be enough, and he orders one more to be sent. The scene returns to the protagonist, and we see that he has already gone with the soldiers. He looks away and says, brother. Then we see the brother's glasses on the bloody table, and then the brother himself. He asks the bandits with a furious face who the hell they are to interrupt his dinner, after which he slits the throat of the last of the three soldiers. Then he notices that someone is talking on a radio located on one of the soldiers' body armor. We hear someone telling them to eliminate Beck E. Su as soon as they find him. My brother doesn't understand how they can still use the radios. And, wiping his face with blood, he asks, who did he say to kill? We also learn that this brother's name is Beck Du Kyung and he is the CEO of a financial company called TS, Tessan Group. After another scuffle with the soldiers, the commander looks around the corner and notices his brother, who is also dealing with his opponents. Beck Du Kyung asks Beck E. Su if these people are guests. The scene then shifts to his brother's car. The brother holds his hand to his head, apparently because of a headache, and asks the commander what he is trying to say but can't pronounce the word. The driver explains that the group is called the NR, and if Beck Du Kyung has trouble pronouncing it, he can call them intelligence. 
a man realizes that his brother is not just a soldier, but a scout. A soldier who goes to North Korea and kills people there. With some comicality, the commander replies to his brother that, in that case, he himself is then not just a bandit, but Boss Tez San. The brother, having made a ponytail out of his hair, realizes that his brother has had an interesting life. The commander asks him to come out here, but gets a negative answer to his request. He explains that if his brother stays with him, they will also be killed, because these men will chase him to his death. With a smirk, the brother replies that the gang boss is very frightened, and therefore he will leave his brother here. He suggests dropping him off at the police station so that he can be killed quickly. The commander says he means it. Then the brother says his name, and we see many people carrying funeral flowers, all dressed in black. The brother says he's not kidding. The commander does not understand what all this means. The assistant director turns to him, asking if they have arrived, and gets the answer that yes, on time. She says that she has got everything ready, just as the gentleman wanted. She then informs him that everything will be ready within two hours. The boss then says that if all these problems are solved when the commander dies, then he should die. The boss then shows him a picture for his grave. The boss explains that it is all a spectacle, and that he learned it from the Japanese Yakuza. This spectacle is used when he needs to clear his name or escape. The protagonist asks whether all these people will believe it or not. The brother replies that of course they will have doubts, so there is one important detail. The boss reports that their organization is much more famous than the commander thinks. He tells them about his brother's death and that high-ranking persons who have come to offer their condolences will be witnesses. Thus, no one will doubt it, for if the boss said it, they will believe it. Then the van arrives, and the guards, not understanding what is going on, speculate whether the food has arrived or whether there are dignitaries in the car. Then we see the chief examining the boss's file. He realizes that he is the brother of the commander. The chief also realizes that the man is a simple bandit, not the director. The guard bangs on the glass, not seeing what is behind it, and yells about how the chief can't just come here. The chief then tells the men in the van that this is their last assignment. He orders them to make sure that Becky Sue is really dead. After that, the chief's men get out of the van. The guard tells the soldier who got out of the van that he can't be here dressed like that and, lifting his cap, demands that he answer. He points out that if the man does not want to answer, he can get back in the car and drive away. But before he can finish his sentence, he gets hit and falls to the ground. The other guards see this and decide to attack the man. However, other soldiers appear from behind this man and begin to fight the guards, easily overpowering them. Thus we learn that this is the second Halra unit engaged in operations in North Korea. A man is shown taking off his jacket and walking down the stairs to his opponents. Stepping in front of one of the soldiers, he explains that this is a family funeral, and only those specifically invited can attend. The opponent does not want to drag it out and decides to attack the man immediately. However, the man does not even feel the impact, as he is much taller and larger than his opponent. We then learn that his name is Ha Jin Un and he is the head of security for the Tae Sang group, also known as the Wall Man. He begins to squeeze the throat of one of the bandits with one hand and then breaks his jaw, resulting in the death of his attacker. The other bandits are surprised at how the man broke their comrade's jaw in one motion. The soldiers then start attacking with their fists, calling the man a bastard. But the man calmly dodges the attacks. He takes one of the attackers by the jaw and prepares to strike with his other hand, but the second bandit manages to strike from behind. The bandit then starts beating the man in the stomach, but you can see that the man doesn't care at all about these blows and nails his attacker to the ground. He then takes the third bandit by the jaw and throws him to the floor, and then delivers the strongest blow with his fist. This is how this fight ends. We see the chief, still in the van, realizing that his men have been defeated. He says that it is only one man. The chief gets out of the car and, approaching the man, apologizes for the misunderstanding. He adds that the man is not a danger and hands him his business card. The chief explains that he is the supervisor of the deceased Isu and has come to offer his condolences. The man slowly turns, turning to the man at the top of the stairs, waiting for an answer. The answer comes, a positive one. He invites the supervisor to continue walking forward. The boss approaches Beck Isu's picture and wonders if he's really dead. Then he turns to Beck Du Kyung to ask how much he knows. Time goes back a few minutes, and we see a dialogue between our brothers. 
They stand at the top of the stairs, and the boss says that betrayal and killing commanders is unacceptable. He asks the commander what to do with Chief Zhang if he sees them. But the commander says that the brother should not get involved in this situation. The brother asks if he should sit down with the commander at the table and ask him not to do it again. He gets the answer that the commander will meet with him himself, and events return to the present moment. The commander, introduced by his brother, addresses Chief Zhang, pulling out his knife. He offers to speak to the chief in private and presents himself to him in an imposing manner. He brings the knife close to the warden's face and asks him if he knows what it is. The guy says that they found it in his brother's body, and the warden should explain himself well if he doesn't want that knife in his body. The guy puts a knife to the warden's throat and maniacally asks who killed his brother. The chief starts to think that Becky Sue is really dead. The chief tells the guy to calm down and begins to tell him that Becky Sue died in an accident while on a mission. He tells him that this information is confidential, so he can't reveal the details. But before he can finish his speech, the guy hits him hard with his fist. The guy says that the boss talks too much and, holding the knife, begins to ask again who killed his brother. But before he can kill the boss, the assistant boss gets in front of him, and the big man tells the boss Zhang that he had better leave. And the guy, as he leaves, yells for him to disappear. The events then move to a room where there is a big man, the assistant boss, the boss himself, and the commander. The boss begins to parody his brother's lines, and he wonders what they are doing here. The brothers start talking, and the boss asks who taught him to play so well, intelligence or something? The brother replies that either way it will buy them some time, and the boss will be back again. He says he will tell them the address himself and asks if they can sneak in, promising them a warm welcome. Gathering his belongings, the commander utters words to the effect that he cannot hide here forever. He also admits that he was not joking when he spoke to his superior, and that he really wanted to kill him. The boss turns to his brother and asks if he is going to announce his living existence. He suggests that his brother stay here and avoid unnecessary noise. He tells him that he is a survivor and that it would be best to work with him. The commander asks his brother if he offers to become a bandit like his brother. He gets an affirmative answer. The boss adds that they survive by beating people anyway. The commander then removes his brother's hand from his arm and silently walks away. The boss says that they are not twins, but merely look alike. He then tells the guard to take the men and watch him. We see the commander in the crosswalk, and behind him, a large man following him. The guy asks if he will continue to follow him, and gets an affirmative answer, as this is the director's order. We are then shown nine cars that have arrived with the guard. Meanwhile, a certain man with a knife in his hands is standing around the corner watching our main character. Events are transferred to the commander, who is standing by the window at the airport, talking to someone. He asks the interlocutor to keep following the commander. Then the chief remembers the look in the commander's eyes and realizes that the commander was ready to kill him. He thinks that Beck Du Kyung knows something. Suddenly someone comes up behind the boss and tells him not to turn around. A mysterious voice tells the warden that if he wants his daughter to be returned unharmed, the warden says he would give anything to keep his daughter safe. The mysterious voice goes on and says that what he wants is to be his daddy. This mysterious voice turns out to be his daughter, who jumps on his back, filled with happiness. The boss asks her daughter if she is tired. The daughter replies that she is tired, because the seats on the plane were stiff and she could not even stretch her legs. The father says he's sorry and promises to book a better seat for her next time. With a slight jolt in the air, a conversation begins between the girl and the man, who greets her after a difficult flight. She expresses her impatience to meet her father as soon as possible. In response, he promises that next time he will ask the pilot to speed up to satisfy her wish. The daughter says that she expected her father to behave so decisively, for he is an intelligence agent. The father, with a smile, explains that he actually just works in an office and does paperwork. The girl concludes that apparently her father can't fight, and her father replies with mild irony that, in fact, he has never been in a fight. The scene shifts to the boss and his loyal assistant. He notices that they are out of cigarettes and offers to go quickly to the store for a new pack. The assistant offers to go herself, but the boss insists that he go himself, because he at least wants to get some fresh air. The girl warns him that it is dangerous, because the head of the security service and his men have gone to watch his brother, and now it is better not to go out alone. The man asks why he can't go out without a security guard, 
to which the girl replies that he doesn't have to be with a security guard, but it's still dangerous to go out now. The guy proposes his plan, and the scene moves to the elevator, where the boss decides to go for cigarettes with his assistant, taking her by the hand. The embarrassment she feels only increases his desire. He asks her if he can get out now, receiving a confused but positive confirmation. In the elevator, in addition to the heroes, there are two guards behind them. One of the characters, with irony in his voice, asks one of the guards to say hello to his sister. This causes a great deal of embarrassment to the girl. The guard, greeting, confuses the girl even more. Then the guy, with contempt in his voice, approaches the guard and asks if his sister is any prettier. The guard replies that the sister is indeed beautiful. The guy agrees, but points out that everyone who calls her sister ends up the same way. He then wonders who the guard is. He assumes that the guard is one of Warden Zhang's underdogs. The guard asks the boss what he wanted to say, but before he can finish his line, the guard pulls out a knife and tries to stab the hero. The guy easily dodges such an obvious attack. A fight between the heroes and the guards begins. The heroes end up in the corner of the elevator, and the boss asks Su Ah for a second knife, which she keeps under her skirt. One of the guards tries to attack again, but the boy calmly dodges and counterattacks, cutting into the guard's stomach. However, he realizes that his knife only cut the guard's jacket, as there was a bulletproof vest underneath. The boss notes that the guards were well prepared. The fight continues, and the hero realizes that his knife is too short to penetrate the body armor. He pushes the guard away with his shoulder and sees that Su Ah is threatened by a second guard who tries to stab her. The guard swings down on the girl from above, but the guy manages to get in front of her and gets stabbed in the shoulder. The guy asks the girl how she is feeling, and with a smirk asks if she has seen anyone get stabbed in a long time. The hero realizes that the guard specifically attacked the girl, which means she could be in trouble. The guard tries to attack the girl again, but the boy saves her again, repelling the attack with his knife and knocking the knife out of her hands. The girl notices the guard trying to grab a knife from the floor, but she quickly kicks it away with her foot and stabs that guard. At this point, the guy attacks the second guard and points both knives at him, threateningly informing him that he will give them a warm welcome. Having dealt with the guards, the heroes reach the right floor. As they exit the elevator, they notice two guards standing with their backs to them, unsuspecting. The boss, as he exits the elevator, comments that these guards are not even capable of doing their jobs, and wonders who allowed them into the elevator. One of the guards notices the director's injured shoulder. The boss calms the others and asks the guard for a cigarette. But instead of a cigarette, the guard pulls out a knife, wounding the guy with a surprise attack. The girl is dumbfounded by what is happening. The hero reacts instantly, grabbing the guard's face and telling him that such a big knife hurts quite a lot. It is then as if the hero shoots a second face at the guard, who explains that he chose such a large knife on purpose, and it is better not to take it out. After that the boss attacks the enemy, but he manages to dodge the blow. As a result, the heroes see the true face of the enemy and his weapon, the karambit. The boss asks the second guard for a knife instead of a cigarette. The guard suggests he and the girl leave, as he wants to apprehend his adversary. The director insists on his request and hands over the knife, asking him to watch the girl along the way. He then orders them to leave and not to open the door to strangers. The hero stands in front of his opponent and asks if he wants to say anything before the end. The opponent asks Beck Du Kiang why he's always so chatty. After that we see the face of the enemy. He is the NR special assassin known as the Phantom. The boss is surprised that this murderer knows his name and asks if he killed his brother. He also realizes that his wound is too serious, and they need to finish with this criminal quickly. The adversary says that if he had the chance to kill his brother, he would do it with great pleasure. The assassin then launches an attack, asking the question, is it true that Becky Su is dead? The boss replies that this is a stupid question, since even Chief Shang has verified Becky Su's death. The adversary decides to rephrase his question by asking where Becky Su is. This perplexes the boss, who calls the assassin a jerk. Now events return to Becky Su. He follows the commander and the guard, seeing them turn the corner. To keep up, he speeds up and gets hit hard in the face. The guy manages to cover his face with his hands, blocking the blow, but flies backwards. Feeling the force of the blow, the guy realizes that his arm is broken. 
Becky Sue approaches him and asks if Zhang sent him to check if the main character is alive. The guy suffering from pain in his arm replies that yes, he thought, the protagonist couldn't just die like that. The hero recognizes the guy's voice and realizes that it is Li Shihe. Li Shihe removes his hood and greets the commander. The guard asks the commander if he knows the guy. Li Shihe answers that they know each other and addresses the guard, calling him a gorilla. He asks what the guard is going to do with his broken arm. The commander puts his hand on the guy's shoulder and says he's sorry. He continues that he should have stayed with him. With his head down, he says sadly that he is the only survivor. The guy replies that they are still alive. Promises that the next time the hero eats delicious food, he should call the guy too. Li Shiyi brings up his hand again and asks the commander why he didn't stop the guard. The commander simply apologizes and asks if the guy was injured. The guy replies that in addition to his broken arm, he is also hungry. Suddenly both characters notice the serious and angry expression on the guard's face as he talks on the phone. They wonder what caused such a reaction. Events return to the boss's fight with the assassin. A series of punches and parries take place. The boss begins to tire of this and tells the assassin to stop ducking at the most important moments. He also realizes that he won't be able to hold out much longer, as his vision begins to blur. The assassin, continuing his fight, asks Beck Du Kyung if he is really Beck Isu's brother. Without an answer, however, the assassin admits that Beck Du Kyung is not bad for a bandit, and strikes with his sarambit, lifting it from the bottom upward and finally reaching his target. The hero steps back, and the assassin again asks where Beck Isu is. In response, the hero takes his hair and presses the blade of his knife against it, preparing to cut off his ponytail. He tells the assassin that he must have heard about his unbridled bravery. The hero then cuts off his own tail. This perplexes the killer, and he asks how dumb the hero can be. In response, the hero picks up his wounds with a menacing look and declares that he himself is Becky Sue. The astonished murderer claims that this is impossible. Then the hero launches his attack, taunting the assassin. Despite the assassin manages to punch the hero in the stomach, he declares that Becky Sue can't be that clumsy and returns the attack. However, the hero notices that the assassin's karambit is attached to a thin rope, and, taking a cut to his hand, hooks the rope with his hand and takes the knife away from his opponent. He then cuts the assassin's face. The assassin falls to the floor, holding his bloody face. The hero orders the assassin to get up and continue the fight. The assassin rises, shouting that the hero is a fucking bandit, and launches another attack. However, his attack proves weak, and the hero repels it by engaging in a fighting stance. The assassin begins to doubt that Becky Sue is really in front of him and can't believe it. He claims it's impossible, and continues his attack, encanting the hero to die. The hero manages to grab his opponent's arm and guides it to his shoulder, plunging the knife into his shoulder. The assassin leans back and falls onto his back. The hero approaches the assassin with a menacing look, and the adversary finally begins to believe that it is Becky Sue in front of him. The assassin with a pitying face asks the hero to stay away from him. The hero internally utters that Becky Sue should have stayed with him, and waves his knife, preparing to deliver a fatal blow to the killer. The assassin begins to scream, realizing that his end is near, but the hero stabs the knife next to his head without delivering a fatal blow. The hero then falls unconscious. This causes surprise and some relief to the murderer, and he calls out to the hero. At this time, the real Beck Isu arrives on the scene. He runs out of the car and sees his unconscious brother. He runs to him and shouts, Brother! Brother! He begs him not to die, but holds his brother's already dead body in his arms. At this time, the murderer lurks down the stairs, immersed in reading some notebook and with a crazy look and voice, declares that he killed Beck Isu. At this time, the protagonist weeps over the body of his dead brother. The action takes place in an apartment with a security guard and a girl sitting on the couch. The girl expresses her displeasure, saying that this is already too much, and that the general meeting and other organizations will soon notice the absence of the director. They come to the conclusion that a new director must be appointed. The guard points out that without Beck Du Kyung, Tez San would no longer be Tez San. The girl is indignant and asks if he's just going to watch Tae Sang disappear and adds that director Beck would never allow that to happen. She says she doesn't want to see Tez San turn into nothing, but the guard interrupts her with, enough. 
The guard realizes the loss of the director and, not holding back tears, says that there is no such person as director anymore. He adds that no one will be able to replace the director at Tez San. The scene changes and we see the commander being hailed by his buddy. The guy stands in front of the commander, stopping him, and asks where he is going. The main character says that the wounds on his brother's body were caused by some trained bastard who was hired by their boss. He mentions many instances where the boss hired special people for questionable cases. So if they can find these people, they can catch the warden red-handed. The guy replies that he knows this and asks the hero what he is going to do. The hero says that he will find and kill this murderer and Zhang's boss. The hero begins to cry and repeats that he will kill them all for what they did to his brother. The scene changes to the Techno Valley of Pangio. We see a large number of people standing in formation. In front of them sits a man cutting potatoes. This man, Kim Taewon, is introduced as the CEO of T1 ICT. The guy says there are only skyscrapers, and no big money to be made here. Walking through the crowd, the guy says that men should play in the wide waters of real Seoul. The hero then tells us that at a general meeting he heard the supervisor say something very unpleasant, addressing a bound man hanging from a skyscraper. This makes the man angry, and he asks what kind of nonsense the guy is talking about. The hero responds to such impertinence by cutting one of the ropes, saying should he throw this hanging pair from the skyscraper. Such actions immediately turn on the bound man's brain and he begins to speak. He reports that Tez San was attacked, as told to him by his friend in Seoul. According to him, Tez San has encountered an unknown problem, so they are not taking any action. In addition, he adds that Beck Dukayang has not been seen anywhere. The hero, cutting the second rope, asks how accurate the information is that Beck Dukayang is nowhere to be seen. The bound man confirms that this information is confirmed and that Beck Dukayang didn't even show up at the meeting. The antagonist asks the connected man if he wants to say anything else. But he gets a negative answer, as that is all he has heard. The hero realizes that he will learn nothing more and cuts the last rope, after which the hostage falls from the skyscraper. The hero then turns to the guard to gather everyone together, for they are to meet Tez San for dinner tonight. At this time the hostage falls to the lower floor and realizes that he is still alive. The action returns to the main character walking through the Majindan livestock market. In his mind he tells himself that someone told him that it is dark under the entrance and that if you want to hide something, you better do it in plain sight. He also adds that this is Chief Zhang's method. Going into one of the stalls, the hero tells himself that all these guys were also trained by Chief Zhang. If the hero lets his guard down, he is finished. He goes into the back of the counter and sees a pile of corpses, all around bathed in blood. He also sees a man in the distance who calls out to him and asks who he is, but interrupts his line when he realizes that Becky Sue is in front of him and asks if he is alive. The man tells the protagonist to put the knife away, because if someone else had come in, he would be dead. The protagonist asks the man what happened here. The man says that it was Chief Zhang who did all this. He ordered everyone to gather and then his men to shoot them all. The man also says that he heard over the radio that Zhang's men took care of everything, and assumes that it happened the same way elsewhere. The man tells Beck Yi Su that Zhang's organization is beyond him. He says that the boss is too strong for the hero and he can't handle him alone, so he advises the hero to run away and survive, and then dies. Events return to the man who was in the skyscraper. Apparently he is in Tez San. He talks about how Tez San was so weak that it collapsed so easily. The thug guard stands in front of the man after beating up a couple of people. The thug tells the hero that he is the fourth man. The fourth time in a week that a bunch of gangsters come to Tessin's house. The hero is perplexed and interrogates, gangsters? Adjusting his tie, the guy says he has tried to be discreet, but now suggests that the hero and his men play a game of like a gangster with him. After that, the guard says that all this is beginning to get tiresome and suggests that the hero and his men attack him. But suddenly Beck E. Su walks through the crowd. No one understands who he is. The guard asks the main character what's going on. The protagonist approaches the guard, saying that he needs the help of the organization to avenge his brother, as he realizes that he cannot do it alone. So he suggests that the guard give Tess San to him. As they are talking, a guy who had previously come in with other people approaches them. He is not pleased that his actions have been interrupted and points a knife at the protagonist, stating that he is busy and the protagonist should get in line. 
Before he can finish his sentence, however, he is struck and overturns. The boy begins to suspect that the man who hit him is Baek Du Kyung, but he can't believe it because Baek Du Kyung has disappeared. Suddenly we see the scene where Baek Du Kyung was killed, and we hear the killer calling out to him. Then the events return and we see Baek Yi Su tackling his opponents, slashing them left and right. The guy who arrives calls our protagonist crazy and predicts Tezen's doom on that day. He orders his men to attack the protagonist. The guy calls his men idiots and asks someone to give him a knife. He then sneaks up behind the main character and starts swinging, shouting the name Baek Du Kyung. But the character turns around too quickly and easily disarms him. With a menacing expression on his face, Baek Yi Su stands in front of his opponent, causing him to be terrified. The guy runs away and shouts for his men to return to Pangio. The remaining guards try to determine whether this man is Director Beck or not. At this time, we hear the thoughts of the bouncer, who recalls his words that Tae Sang would cease to be Tae Sang without Beck Du Kyung, and apparently after seeing Beck Yi Su in action, he begins to change his mind. Then we hear the other fighters say again that the director has come to rescue them, but their conversations are interrupted by a thug. He asks if Beck Yi Su wants to get Tae San. And if he does, there's only one way. Events are transferred to some kind of meeting. We see a large round table and four participants, but there is no fifth participant, because the fifth chair at the table remains empty. One of the participants in the meeting says that a month has passed and that Baek Du Kyung still hasn't shown up. Another man finds the meeting extremely ridiculous and adds that he warned about the need to get rid of Baek Du Kyung. Their conversation is interrupted by a third table member a woman who reports that she recently heard a funny rumor. She says that there are rumors about Baek Du Kyung's death. The fourth participant, taking a glass from the table, says that if this is true, then Tae Sang is finished. At this time Baek Yi Su enters the room. The protagonist notices that everyone in the meeting was so concerned about him. He sits down in a chair, and his assistant Shay and the guard get behind him. Baek Yi Su apologizes for not bringing souvenirs to people. At that time, we hear the guard's words, which he didn't get a chance to finish, saying that if Baek Yi Su really wants to get Tae Sang, he needs to become Baek Du Jiayun. Events go back a bit in time, to Tessin's penthouse, where Baek Yi Su's training seems to be underway. The girl shows the hero how to hold the blade properly so that it will be strong. The protagonist feels perplexed and turns to the girl to find out why all this is necessary. He asks her the question, would anyone be able to notice such little things? She replies that some people will certainly be able to notice it. Moreover, if it's a general gathering, Baek Yi Su should be especially attentive. Then the girl begins to talk about the meeting itself. She explains that it is a meeting of the leaders of the largest criminal gangs in Seoul. The purpose of such a meeting is to prevent conflicts between the gangs and to support each other but in fact each of the people present is waiting for his chance to profit from future confrontations. The protagonist now understands why Tez San must be present at the meeting. The girl confirms this and warns the hero to be careful. The girl then begins to express her doubts and lack of understanding as to why Baek Yi Su should pretend to protect Tez San. The hero answers her that he needs Tae Sang to exact his revenge. He explains that Tez San is an organization that is more powerful and powerful than others. That is why he needs the Universal Organization and Tez San to do his bidding. The scene switches to Zhang's boss. We see a man sitting next to the boss in a chair, who tells Zhang that he did a good job. Then we are introduced to this man, Seoul's police chief, Zhou Wenho. Zhang says that all of this was possible because of Zhou Wenho's support and that they were all capable fighters. But the police chief denies this, believing that everything was possible because of Zhang's leadership abilities. The police chief then turns to Zhang and asks why his subordinates were buried here, under a layer of concrete. Zhang modestly replies that it was a sacrifice for the common good. The police chief begins to applaud and laugh, saying that he likes this approach, and utters the saying, work in the dark and strive for the light. He then says that officials have been very concerned lately, and claims that the special operations unit in North Korea is obsolete. Zhang agrees with him and explains that he was under a lot of pressure, he was ordered to do many different things, and that's why he was so busy. In response, the police chief looks Zhang in the eye and asks in a menacing voice why he constantly lets him down. He wonders how difficult it is to eliminate a couple of people, and why Zhang is such a problem. The chief starts yelling at him and mentions that he's had to spend a lot of money to get the Tez San case squelched. Zhang apologizes for the inconvenience and trouble, 
But the boss doesn't accept his apology and asks why he eliminated Baek Du Kayang. He points out that Tae Sang is a member of the General Assembly and asks if Zhang understands the significance of this. Zhang explains that this is why they turn to the chief for help, as only he is in a position to help. All of this makes the police chief even more aggressive, and he turns to insults against Zhang. Zhang gets angry at this and with a decisive move takes the police chief's badge away from Zhou Wenho. He tells Zhou Wenho to remember who is really the boss here. He explains that Zhou Wenho's role in this project is only to be a public figure, not himself. Zhang then throws his badge into the concrete pool and says that there are many people here who can replace Cho Wen Ho, and if he doesn't like something, he can leave. These words cause the guard to become aggressive, and he grabs Zhang by the shoulder, ordering him to watch his mouth. The guard adds that the police chief is not a buddy to Zhang. Cho Wen Ho notices Zhang's quick hands and asks why he threw away his badge and asks for it back. Zhang knocks the guard down and kicks him in the face. Jang then pulls out a gun and points it at the police chief, declaring that he is about to bury him along with everyone else. Zhou Wenho instantly raises his hands and begins apologizing for everything he said. Zhang says that he's already buried all his subordinates here, and he doesn't care about any general assembly. The police chief keeps shouting that he will deal with everyone, because he knows the people in the assembly. At the end, Jang puts his gun away and suggests that Zhou Wenho not let each other down anymore. He also tells his boss that he wants to meet Baek Du Kyung. The plot switches back to a meeting where the participants discuss the rumor of Baek Du Kyung's death. One of the participants introduces himself as Ryu Taehyun, the general manager of Jiorang Resort. He says that Baek Du Kyung does not deserve to be here. Another participant, Han Hae Sung, CEO of HHS Entertainment, asks him why he reacts this way every time Baek Du Kyung is mentioned. Ryu loudly claims that he is the only one making noise. He claims that Baek Du Kyung has no right to appropriate important areas of Hangnam Dong. Ryu believes that Baek Du Kyung should be punished. Suddenly the girl asks Ryu if he wants to stab him that badly and if he hates him that deeply. Then we meet this girl, her name is Cha Yu Wa, and she is the owner of a trading company called Chio Nun. Ryu goes on to say that Cha Yu Wa is just trying to piss him off and asks if she wants to make him into a bad guy or something. Their conversation is interrupted by another table member who says that they are here to improve relations between everyone. This man introduces himself as the CEO of Yilhak Capital, Lee Sungmin. Ryu, putting his cigarette on the table, tells Sungmin that he will not be comfortable being with him if he continues to behave so inappropriately. Ryu thinks that Sungmin doesn't deserve to be here because his power is limited to one small town. Sung Min starts to talk about how this meeting was created by the former Il Hak chairman, but he is interrupted by another table member who asked him to pass him the soy sauce. He starts handing over the sauce, at which point Ryu calls the guy names, demanding that he show at least a little respect since he is here with everyone else. At this time, Baek Yi Su, Baek Du Kyung's assistant, enters the room and says that the place looks suitable, judging by the tense atmosphere. The hero is introduced to the people sitting at the table, causing great surprise to all present. The next scene opens with the events going back some time. The protagonist sits down in his car and begins to discuss the participants in the meeting. He notes that their numbers are not that great, but it is explained to him that the quantitative aspect is not the most important. The most important thing is the quality of the relationship between them. It is explained to the protagonist that there is a concept of dog friendship. The protagonist suddenly realizes that the only thing they need to do is to solve the problem the way Baek Du Kyung would. The scene then returns to the gathering, where the hero cordially greets everyone present. One girl remarks that she doesn't recognize the hero because he changed his hair, to which the guy replies that he wanted to impress her, but unfortunately, she didn't even recognize him. Ryu utters a harsh phrase apologizing that the hero is not dead, as he had hoped he would be. But the hero responds to this insolence in a simple but effective way, he asks Ryu if he will eat with his hands like a baby. If so, the hero takes away his sticks. This provokes aggression from Ryu and laughter from the girl. At this point the other man turns to the protagonist. He informs the main character that while he was away, they discussed many important things. Baek Yi Su expresses some surprise about this. He also suggests that the people at the meeting were very worried about him so the protagonist should bring a souvenir. The same man who informed the hero that they had discussed much tells him that they had all heard about his brother's death. 
Ryu says he heard that the funeral was extremely tense and asks if there really was a knife fight. The man then says that it's time to take stock and decide whether Baek Du Kyung deserves to attend the meeting. The main character turns to the guy and asks if he knew that the hero was having a hard time, why didn't he come and support him? The hero then suddenly takes a kitchen knife and plunges it into the table. With a furious expression on his face, he declares that the people in the meeting have no right to speak about Tessin's qualifications. The man with the glasses asks the protagonist if he wants to turn them into enemies or something like that. To which the protagonist declares that Tez San will no longer attend meetings, and let the others do what they want. The next moment, our heroes leave the scene and the driver, turning to the protagonist, says, the general assembly has become our enemy, do you have any plan? The car with the protagonist is suddenly abruptly cut off by another car, causing shock to the protagonist's assistant, who, opening his window, exclaims, damn it. Soon three cars surround the hero's car. Ryu gets out of one of the cars and yells at the protagonist, asking if he spilled shit on them all. Coming up to the car, Ryu puts a brass knuckle on his hand and points out that the main character said as if they could do as they please. Ryu then punches through the car window and stops his hand in front of Becky Su's face, telling him to hand over Tessan. Becky Su's assistant explains to the hero that when he presses the button, the side mirror moves, and the guard offers to return it to its original position so it doesn't interfere with traffic. The guard's question about whether Becky Su is satisfied with the course of events causes confusion for the protagonist, who declares that he will bring everyone to their knees, but before that they need to find the rat. The white-haired hero doesn't understand who this rat in the general assembly could be, while the guard wonders what made the hero come to this conclusion. Becky Su explains that Ryu reported the crazy funeral and the knife fight. The protagonist points out that although his brother did inform the gathering about the funeral, everything going on in Tez San has nothing to do with them. This causes the guard and the white-haired hero to be absolutely astonished. The white-haired man says that the protagonist is right, and he feels goosebumps, not understanding how he could have missed it. The guard begins to speculate and claims that someone really knows what happened back then. The protagonist declares that this is why he will not participate in the gathering and will only return when they find the rat. The guard asks how the hero is going to find the rat, and gets the answer that they will just smoke it out of the hole and it will get out on its own. Some time later, Ryu orders Becky Su out of the car, while surrounded by many other cars and people interested in the hero. Ryu offers to help, given that the protagonist has turned out to be clumsy. At this point, we learn of Becky Su's thoughts, to whom it becomes clear that Ryu has a serious problem with Tez San and is hostile to him. The hero begins to suspect that Ryu is a rat. Finally, a guy with white hair crawls out the window and asks Ryu why he didn't just ask to open the door, given that the car is expensive. The guy starts sassing Ryu, calling him a kid who eats without chopsticks. Ryu interrogates if the guy is too cocky and calls him a bastard. In response, the guy says that Ryu also happens to be deaf. He mentions that this is the first time he's ever ridden in a car like this, and everything was fine until Ryu showed up. Ryu declares that he likes the guy's sass and offers to work together. The guy agrees, but only on the condition that he be Ryu's boss. He then offers to deal with it at the auto center, but Ryu unexpectedly punches the guy in the face, who easily stops him by starting to sass him and saying, is that it? He then asks Ryu if he is a real gangster. This causes Ryu to be surprised, and he says that he really likes the guy. At this time several white cars drive up to the place, and Ryu notices that something interesting is brewing. He turns to Sung Min to find out if this is the case. Sung Min suggests that Ryu stop there. We then learn that Lee Sung Min is the CEO of Ilhak Capital. Ryu, showing his middle finger, agrees with Sung Min and says they will have a party after the meeting. He suggests that Sung Min join in and asks if Ilhak members can do such a thing. Suddenly someone puts a hand on Ryu's shoulder. The big man says that Ryu was still crying yesterday because of a cut on his stomach and comments that Ryu has grown up a lot. Ryu asks the man what brought his old ass here. The guy with the white hair asks the guard who the man is. The guard explains that he is Ilhak's elite and is surprised to find him here. He tells them that Ilhak's prestige has already fallen, but in the last generation they were the best organization in Seoul. They were known as the Nine Knives. The guy with the white hair comments that bandits are also good storytellers, and looking at the faces of the other bandits, he realizes that the guard is not lying. The bandits express surprise and say it's the Nine Knives, and the man is called Choi Jong-ho. 
The old man says that today's young men are very spineless. We learn that Choi Jong Ho is the executive director of Ilhak Capital and a second generation Gudo. At this time, the guard gets out of the car and greets the man, saying it's been a long time. The man comments that Ji Nun has gotten very big, which surprises him. Ji Nun replies that he should have greeted the man, but unfortunately they met that way. Sung Min suggests that Ryu invite Tez San to the party as a guest, and Ryu tells him to do whatever he wants. The guy with white hair, seeing Ryu order his driver to start the car, whispers to himself that Ryu is an idiot. Then Sung Min suddenly approaches Bek Yi Su and suggests that he drive his car since Bek Yi Su's car is in bad shape due to broken glass. Bek Yi Su feels some insecurity when Sung Min suddenly approaches the window, and the main character confesses a little fearfully to Sung Min himself. Next, the old man turns to the guard and Shiran, ordering them to move forward as he needs to have a private conversation with Director Beck. The guard objects, but Beck Yi Su assures them that everything will be fine. Thus begins the journey of our heroes. Sung Min approaches Beck Yi Su, asking if it's true that Tez San is leaving the group. The main character replies that Tez San was expelled, and he just lost his temper when it came to his qualifications. Sung Min warns that if Tez San leaves the meeting, there will be problems with other organizations. The protagonist confirms this and says that no one knows when someone will try to defeat Tez San again. He, looking out the window, ponders to himself what Sung Min wants to say. Lee then explains that there is nothing but testing and competition in the gatherings, and so Tez San needs strength to survive. The hero does not understand Sung Min's intentions and asks him directly about it. The car stops at the port and Sung Min, with a menacing expression on his face, declares that he needs strength. The camera then shows our hero's puzzled looks. We return to the broken glass of the hero's car. The guard and the old man discuss Ryu. The old man calls Ryu a scumbag. The old man asks Jean Woon when he intends to join them, to which he receives a negative answer. Jean Woon explains that he doesn't want to discuss the subject because he works for Tae Sang. The old man points out that Jean Yuan's past is connected to Gudo, and they have a place for him. Jean Un firmly states that his organization is Tae San, and he has business to attend to. Finishing his dialogue, the old man says that Jean Un is not needed here. He concludes his words by stating that Tez San will fall today. The guard expresses unbelievable surprise. Back to the main character again. He sees people from the Nine Knives organization through the window. One of them declares that their organization will take care of our hero. The protagonist turns to Sung Min, asking about the meaning of it all. The guy replies that this is the best they have to offer. The hero then holds his hands over his face and tells Sung Min that he was a traitorous rat. He then turns to Shiran and asks him to detain Sung Min. The guard behind the wheel calls the protagonist a scum, for which he gets punched in the face by Shiran, and he tells the guard to shut up. The main character gets out of the car and stands in front of the black guy. At this time, Sung Min declares that it won't be long, a minute at most. Then we see Ryu smoking a cigarette and saying that Sung Min has guts, since he brought the nine knives to the case. The guard asks Ryu how strong the nine knives are given that Ryu has more people and they can use that to get rid of the nine knives. Ryu points out to the guard how stupid he is and says that they don't know anything and are talking some nonsense. He then slaps the guard on the back of the head with his palm and asks if he knows how to fight even a little. As Ryu smokes a cigarette, he says that the guards are idiots and don't understand anything, but are hanging around anyway. Ryu then asks the guard how he thinks Ilhak took over Seoul in the past and how they managed to maintain their position in the assembly by being dummies like this guard. Ryu declares that Ilhak has the nine knives, and he has seen them with his own eyes. Even three of them could destroy the entire Kanbuk area. There used to be nine, but now there are only six left. But even that number is enough to destroy an entire neighborhood. Then he asks the guard what kind of idiot would confront them. The scene changes and the protagonist punches a member of the Nine Knives in the face. While the protagonist is beating up this black guy, Ryu continues his monologue and says that there is no one who can destroy Gudo. And if such a person exists, he will be the strongest in Seoul. Events take us to the pier, where the police chief meets Sung Min for casual conversation. Surrounded by the sea breeze, they discuss important issues. The chief, leaning towards Sung Min, expresses his concern about the change that is happening to Tae San. He tells Sung Min that Tae Sang is no longer the same, but has rather become a collection of scum. 
The boss points out that Beck Du Kaiyang lost his younger brother because of the senior management project, and this has led to growing chaos in Tezsan. He emphasizes that now is the perfect moment for Il Hak to strike the first blow. We are then shown who Lee Sung Min is. Although the boy hesitates whether to attack, the boss interrupts his pondering, warning that if Sung Min continues to avoid direct answers, he will lose everything he has. The supervisor tells the boy that he understands his tendency to be cautious, but now such behavior is unacceptable. He warns that if the chairman came back and found out about it, he would erupt in rage. The chief also notes that if Sung Min had mentioned the nine knives at the meeting, no one would have dared even squeak in his direction. He questions why the guy doesn't use such a powerful weapon. The man continues his speech and says that he used to think that Sung Min would be the real chairman. He thinks that the guy needs to reorganize Il Hak by using Tezsan. Then, smoking a cigarette, the boss concludes that it is necessary to destroy Tezsan in order to restore order. Sun Min gets up from his chair and offers to take part in the project. The boss notes that Sun Min is rather insatiable, but stresses that this is not an insult. It's more of a praise. The man explains that the project is called One Sink, but admits that he doesn't understand how Sun Min is going to take a place in it. The scene shifts to the protagonist observing the beating of a member of the Nine Knives. The hero notes that getting rid of this man and destroying Tez San was a fatal mistake. The hero then declares that Il Hak will be destroyed today. Hearing this, Sung Min tries to get out of the car, but is stopped by Shur He, threatening him with a knife. Shur He asks the guy where he is going and explains that he has been ordered to capture Sung Min. Then the black man who was beaten by the protagonist stands up and raises his glasses. He tells the hero that he was in a bit of pain, and if he were a dozen years older, he probably wouldn't have been able to keep fighting anymore. In the gloomy hall, one member of the dangerous gang known as the Nine Knives notices the smell of Hyunnim's blood and warns the others. Another gang member notes that no one has dared to touch Hyunnim for so long. This makes Hyunnim uneasy, and he informs the others that his hideout has been infiltrated. He wonders if the other members of the Nine Knives will just watch it, whereupon one of the men suggests that an attack be launched. The first man strikes quickly, but the protagonist easily parries it. The other man then tries to attack, but the protagonist avoids his blow with ease. The man with the ponytail strikes the protagonist and calls himself a member of the legendary Nine Knives gang. On the screen, we are introduced to him as Choi Gwangpao. Then the protagonist is kicked and the man who kicked the protagonist mocks the protagonist, asking how he dares to talk about destroying Il Hawk. This man is called Lee Gyu Chan. The hero blocks the next man's blow and jumps back. His name is Jack Tok Pei. Inside his head, the protagonist realizes that each of the members of the Nine Knives is dangerous and highly trained. He realizes that each of them attacks from different angles and that he needs to attack their weaknesses in order to defeat them one by one. The protagonist then stabs the black guy hard, who apparently can no longer stand on his feet. Another gang member backs him up, asking if he has forgotten what the Lord told them, that they must destroy Tez San. This man is called Lee Soon Mon. Suddenly the main character is punched in the face, and we are presented with two new members of the Nine Knives, Lee Soon Man and Dako Yan Gil. A surprised sure he wonders aloud who these men are, and Sung Min explains that they are members of the Il Hawk Knives, their well-known subgroup called the Nine Knives. Then we are shown an old man beating Ji Nun, who has refused to cooperate. The old man says that Il Hawk's days are long gone, but there are things everyone has forgotten. He orders Jean Un to stop resisting and throws him on the hood of the car. The old man warns that this is Jean Woon's last chance. The scene switches back to Sher. Sung Min asks him if he can handle the nine knives. Sher asks Sung Min to stay in the car and not move from there. Sung Min replies that even if Sher helps the main character, nothing will change. Sher responds by getting cocky, saying that he's not going to help, and if he doesn't go there, all the members of the nine knives will die. We are then shown the protagonist hitting a man with a ponytail hard, but immediately receives a backlash from another member of the group, who suggests that the protagonist just give up. Two other members of the Nine Knives then rush to beat up the protagonist, stating that he must be done away with. Suddenly Shea runs up and kicks one of the men in the face. This stuns them, and the one who received the blow asks the other if Shea should be dealt with. Remembering his past injuries, Shea realizes that he had better not strain himself. He offers to start a fight. Now the protagonist launches a series of attacks and manages to dislocate one of the men's joints, rendering him unable to move. 
Then the man with the ponytail attacks with his foot, and the black guy yells at him to stop. Next in the story is a fascinating flashback that immerses us in the world of Becky Sue. We watch him train intensely with a certain guy in glasses, who assures the hero that his physical shape and strength are superior to the skills our hero possesses. An important teaching that the guy with the glasses imparts to the hero is that there are no miracle tricks in fighting as in life. If the hero cannot hold out and endure the pain, it will mean his defeat. This guy also mentions that sometimes you meet people who are full of energy and have an unwavering will, never letting up. In such cases, it is necessary to limit the movement of their arms and legs so that they cannot continue to attack, and eventually their physical capabilities will not be able to withstand such exertion. At that time, Becky Sue complains to his mentor about the pain caused by the training. The mentor, ignoring his complaints, says that if the hero couldn't take it, they will repeat the training again and orders Becky Sue to attack. We return to the present time when Becky Sue is fighting his opponent. We see him handling the man who attacked him with his foot with ease. The black guy can't believe his eyes and declares that this can't be possible. Suddenly Min's son, Sung Min, sees this fight from the car window and exclaims our hero's name. This reminds him of an earlier conversation with the police chief. The boss asks how Beck Du Kyung is doing, but Sung Min doesn't understand who he's talking about. The warden explains that Beck Du Kyung's brother was extremely talented, and maybe Beck Du Kyung is different from the usual criminals, too. At this time, as the warden tries to catch a fish, Sung Min tries to remember the name of Beck Du Kyung's brother. The plot returns to the present tense. A black man sits on his knees in front of the protagonist, and the hero is ready to deliver a fatal blow. Before he does so, however, Sung Min gets out of the car and stops him, telling him that that's enough and it's time to call it a day. After that, Sung Min walks up to Beck Yi Su, puts his hand on his shoulder and says with a puzzled look on his face that they need to talk. As Sung Min approached the main character, a reflection flashed through his mind. From the beginning, something about the protagonist seemed strange to Sung Min. He realized that even though Beck Yi Su, who had become a problem, had been eliminated, the real reason he had to eliminate Beck Du Kyung was because of their twin relationship. Sung Min then shared his certainty that the main character was not Beck Du Kyung. The main character removed his arm from his shoulder and stated with a frantic expression that it didn't matter, and then threateningly stated that he wouldn't let Sung Min live. Sung Min then approached Beck Yi Su, calling him director Beck Du Kyung, and offered to negotiate. Beck Yi Su did not respond to his words. Then sure, who the Nine Knives were fighting with, raised his hand in a timeout sign and suggested that the fight stop temporarily as Sung Min and Becky Su began to talk. One of the men remarked that Sher was very smart. The negotiations began. Our heroes took their places in the container, while the others, wounded in the fight, rested outside. Sun Min acknowledged the strength of our heroes. The old man turned his attention to the battered members of the Nine Knives and asked if they were all right. The black guy replied that the main character was just a monster and was on a completely different level. The protagonist then asked Sung Min what kind of deal he was offering. Sher noticed the guard and said that the old man seemed quite healthy and wondered if the guard had lost to him. He also pointed to the other men and said that they had failed our protagonist. The guard explained that the heroes beat them because these men were in bad shape. She suggested that the guard had deliberately lost to the old man but all he got in return was an admonition to concentrate. Sung Min was then handed a document, and he explained that there had recently been a request to get rid of Tae Sang and our main character. He added that the information about who was behind it all was contained in this document that had just been handed to him. The hero did not understand exactly what Sung Min wanted. He replied that he would provide information about the organization that plans to attack Taesan in exchange for Taesan joining Ohak. The protagonist stated that if these conditions were basic, then the negotiations were over. Then the hero asked why they wouldn't just get rid of Ilkak and arrest him now. These words angered the hero and he stood in front of his enemies in an imposing posture. The old man started laughing and asked the main character if he wanted to get rid of them or if it was all a joke. He then told the protagonist that he was very arrogant. The protagonist took a few steps forward, but was stopped by the guard and asked what he was doing. The guard stated that it was a good offer for Tezen and an opportunity to gain Ilhak's trust. The main character is tired of all this. He said that the guys from Ilkak were just bandits and nothing more, and what kind of trust could there be in such a situation? He also noted that his comrades and his brother were killed because of these bandits. The guard called the main character Mr. Becky Sue, but
but he grabbed his jacket and introduced himself as Beck Du Kyung. Shur intervened and asked them to calm down, adding that they weren't in kindergarten and suggesting they deal with Sung Min first. Then the protagonist and Sung Min exchanged serious looks. Sung Min agreed that it wasn't a bad suggestion. The main character pointed out that he wasn't going to trust just on the basis of some piece of paper. Sung Min threatened to burn the document at the stake and warned the protagonist to be careful in his words and actions because there are no other copies of this document. This caused the protagonist to become aggressive, and he warned Sung Min not to try to do so by pulling a knife from behind his back. Clutching a knife in his hand, the protagonist points it toward the nine knives. He blurts out that he doesn't trust those damn rats, and then confesses that, in fact, he doesn't trust anyone. The hero then warns that he'd better not be told what to do, since from now on the nine knives must obey his orders. Becky Sue adds that Ilhawk will now be under Tessin's direction. The hero, holding a knife to Sung Min's neck, declares that he will take him hostage. A black member of the Nine Knives notices this and realizes that our protagonist is a bastard. He says it out loud and intends to help Sung Min, but is stopped by an old man who orders everyone not to move. An old man approaches the protagonist, takes the knife away, and offers an alternative. He introduces himself as Choi Jong Ho, executive director of the Nine Knives, and tells the protagonist that he himself will go as a hostage, if possible. The protagonist mockingly replies that the old man is worthless, and asks who is arrogant here now. At this time the guard approaches the protagonist and says that the nine knives symbolize Ilhawk, and the old man will suffice. Becky Sue remarks that it's none of his business to decide who will be enough, to which the guard replies that if Beck Du Kyung were here, he wouldn't have done so. The protagonist then turns to Lee Sher Own and entrusts him with the responsibility of transporting and supervising Choi Jong Ho. Events then take us back five years, where we see the interrogation room and the people behind the glass watching what is happening. The hero is asked questions. He is asked if he is Becky Soo, a member of Baekdu, the North Korean team. The hero confirms. We are then shown the handcuffed hero and introduced to him as Becky Soo, a member of the HID Special Operations Unit in North Korea. He has returned after a lengthy infiltration into North Korea and is currently under investigation for espionage. The man in front of the hero asks about the purpose of his mission, to which the hero replies that it is confidential information. The man does not understand what it could be if it is confidential. Next we are introduced to this man, Kim Jack Wook. He is a lieutenant colonel in the Defense Security Command. Kim tells the hero that he crossed the military demarcation line dressed in a North Korean military uniform and they were unable to identify him. The hero responds that because of the nature of the mission, all the operatives have been anonymized. Kim asks for the name of the hero's immediate supervisor or the location of his military unit. The hero replies that this is confidential information and asks Kim to establish a secure line of communication. Kim gets annoyed and tells the hero that he doesn't like the North Korean task force and suggests that the hero help each other or he will personally arrange for the hero's dismissal. He also adds that if the hero thinks they will do anything he asks, the hero is deeply mistaken. With a snap of his fingers, the man orders Becky Sue to do whatever he is told. And if the man calls the hero a communist, then he is a communist. The man then turns to the hero, confident that he has completed many difficult tasks, and offers to tell him everything. At this time, Zhang's superior enters the room. Zhang greets the man and introduces himself as Zhang Sungho, commander of the Special Operations Division of the Intelligence Agency. He mentions that he heard that his unit owes them something, but doesn't have time to finish the sentence before Kim interrupts him. The man greets Commander Zhang and declares that it is his job to catch spies. Zhang pulls out a cigarette and starts laughing, claiming that Becky Su is not a spy, but his friend. Kim insists on his point of view, thinking that Becky Su is a spy. Zhang says that Kim may have misunderstood his words. Kim confirms that this judgment is correct, and to avoid misunderstanding, Zhang should work more responsibly. Then Zhang, smoking a cigarette and with a serious expression on his face, declares to Kim that he is deaf and did not hear what Zhang said. He points out that Becky Su is his man, and he doesn't care whether Kim thinks the main character is a communist or not. Zhang claims that Becky Su is not a communist and takes him with him as he leaves the interrogation room. This causes Kim to become aggressive, and he orders those outside to stop the heroes, but when he leaves the room, Kim finds only the corpses of his subordinates. The action then shifts to the street, where Zhang and the protagonist begin a conversation. 
Zhang asks the protagonist if he was detained when he returned. The hero replies that yes, and thanks God that no one believed him and no one knows about his secret operation. Zhang smiles and says that actually no one would have believed him, and the hero should have been told that he was just defecting. Zhang then says that he trusts the hero anyway and considers him part of his family. However, if Zhang's daughter says that Becky Su is a spy, Zhang will shoot him. This brings a smile to the hero's face. As he descends the stairs, the hero asks Zhang if Lieutenant Colonel Kim is not his superior. Zhang asks the hero not to be reminded of this and tells him that Kim tried to humiliate him when Zhang first got there. Afterwards, we see Li Shi he get out of the car and wave to the protagonist. He asks why the hero and Zhang are taking so long. Li Shi he also says that it's time for them all to go eat, as he is starving. He starts making jokes about the protagonist's hair, saying that he looks like a real spy. Zhang then greets the hero upon his return, and they all take a picture together. Then the events are transferred to the present. The protagonist is dozing, leaning on a table. Someone knocks on the door, and the hero invites him in. The guard reports that Shiran is now looking after Choi Jongho. The hero says it's a good job. After that, the guard asks permission to say something. The hero begins to talk about the fact that if the guard starts talking about Ilkak again, but he does not have time to finish the sentence when the man grabs him by the shirt and informs him that he was wrong about the protagonist and cannot trust him with Tez San. He also says that the main character will never be like Baek Du Kyung. Events then shift to the boss, Zhang, who is sitting at a table in a cafe. The man calls his daughter and asks if she has eaten. The girl asks if he has eaten, and he replies that he is just beginning to eat, while reminding her of the importance of study and healthy eating. The man says that he is not complaining, just worried about his daughter. At this time, another man enters the cafe and greets Zhang's boss. The man turns out to be the chief of police. The man says he knows some good places to write about and doesn't understand why they came here, but before he can finish, he is interrupted by Zhang, who is on the phone. He also waves his hand for the police chief to shut up. Zhang tells her daughter that it is a bit noisy and promises her that she will call again. At this time, the police chief orders the same food as Zhang, but without the giblets. The boss asks Zhang if his daughter has arrived after studying abroad. Zhang does not answer the question and asks about the general assembly himself. The boss says that they have just been set the table and need to eat first before engaging in dialogue. He also asks Zhang to at least pretend to eat and asks if there is any news. Zhang claims that the members of the general assembly are not the usual bandits. At this point, the chief pours rice into the soup, and Zhang, not understanding his actions, asks what he is doing. The man replies that it is necessary because if you don't eat the rice immediately in this way, you can burn your tongue. He then says that he has seen many things in his life, but that the members of the general assembly are not as simple as they may seem. The man also remarks that Zhang has good skills, but that what he has learned has been rather obvious, and is of little use. Zhang objects, saying that in any case, all the participants in the General Assembly are amateurs, whereas he and his team are professionals, and they won't have any trouble dealing with them. Zhang excitedly announces the impending launch of the OneSync project and that this time he will have to meet with the General Assembly himself. This shocks his boss, who wonders who exactly Zhang is going to meet. The boss assumes it will be Sung Min, and asks Zhang if he knows anyone else from the gathering. The boss then suggests that in order to successfully launch the OneSync project, Zhang needs full control of the General Assembly, and if the officials find out about it, everything will go smoothly. Zhang explains that in the end, Becky Su and his comrades were accused of communism and were dealt with. The boss asks Zhang if he can use this situation to get to know future subordinates better. Zhang replies that if the boss wants to do it, let him do it himself, otherwise let him forget about the idea. While the supervisor adds rice to the soup, he warns that this approach could lead to total chaos. The scene switches to the main character, who sits dejected. He takes a picture of his team out of his pocket and doesn't understand why they all had to die. Then we see the dialogue between the guard and the protagonist. Meanwhile, Li Shi he notices the old man talking on the phone. The old man informs Sung Min that everything is fine in Taesan and he feels like he is on vacation. Sung Min expresses regret and admits his inattention. The old man replies that it was in the best interest of the organization, and everyone decided to trust Sung Min and follow his decisions. He continues by saying that while the outcome may not be perfect, the decision was reasonable. 
The old man then says goodbye to Sung Min and warns the hero to be careful. Lee Sure he remarks that the old man was talking to him as if he were his grandson, not his boss. The old man replies with a smile that this is indeed true and that if he had a grandson, he would be just like his boss. Then Shay he gets more serious and asks the old man what would happen if they hurt him. The old man replies that it is his own decision, and he will accept its consequences. Sure he further asks the old man if this is not an instruction from the boss, for an order is an order, and now the old man is carrying it out. This causes the old man some bewilderment, and he says that things are different from his expectations, and he is disappointed in Tez San, if indeed this is the case. The scene then returns to the dialogue between the guard and the protagonist when the guard says he can't trust Tez San the hero. The guard says that the protagonist must leave. This causes the hero to become aggressive, and he calls the guard a bastard, saying that the guard can't just give the organization away and then take it back. The hero says that he has already used Tez San for his own revenge purposes and even Ohak is in their hands, and he does not understand what the problem is. The guard explains that the problem isn't the protagonist's methods, but that he doesn't know how to pretend to be Beck Du Kyung. The guard says that if Beck Du Kyung were here, he wouldn't act the way our protagonist does. The guard explains that Tez San trusted Beck Du Kyung and made him his boss, and if the protagonist wants to be like his brother, he must show the same loyalty to the organization. The hero threw his hair back proudly and pronounced that this explained why Tez San was still taking part in such childish games as the General Assembly. Then he turned to the guard and looked at him sternly. The hero questioned his faith and stressed whether the organization should not obey the boss's orders. He also explained his methods, stating that he was simply using his power like a real thug. Then the guard took off his jacket and offered to test the hero to see how he could handle such a child's game as the guard himself. Their fight began. The hero immediately attacked and kicked, but the guard repulsed him. Then the guard himself launched his attack and knocked the hero to the ground. The guard asked mockingly, that's all the intelligence he could do, but before he could finish his sentence, he was hit on the chin. There is a large abrasion on the guard's chin. Then we see a dialogue between the old man and Shir Ona. The old man asks Shir Ona, if Tez San is an organization that obeys only force, who will follow it? The old man says they are all called bandits, but what does that mean? He says they only trust each other with their fists and their pride, and they only fight wars because they have united with the same people and are fighting for the same interests. Then the old man says that if you meet a man who only fights and a man who stabs you in the back, you can find among them someone you want to believe in and want to follow. The scene then returns to the fight between the protagonist and the guard. The guard lies on the floor, defeated. The hero is ready to deliver the death blow, but he stops and walks away. As he walks away, he admits he was wrong and asks for forgiveness. He also says that the problem is not the way he solves cases. Then the scene switches back to the dialogue between the old man and Sharona. The old man says that their system should not be based on power differences alone, and that if the organization decided everything by force alone, it would already be an army. Lee Sher he agrees and notices a notification on his phone. He gets up from the couch and tells the old man to wish him a nice rest. The old man asks if he should follow Sharon to which he receives the reply that the old man doesn't seem to be going to run away. Then Shiran wants to ask the old man a question. Suppose there is a man who cannot trust anyone, I wonder if such a man would not try to impose his will by force on the rest of the people, but, not wanting to hear the answer to that question, sure he asks him to forget about it. Then we see Shiran meet the main character. The hero tells him that from now on they will do things their own way and create a new organization, attracting capable and strong people. He tells Shiran to contact the people the protagonist mentioned earlier. They are all professionals who do their jobs perfectly. The hero gives Shiran a deadline of one week, after which they will get rid of the general assembly. The scene then shifts to the guard lying on the floor, immersed in memories of the past. The audience is presented with his memories. Events take us back four years, when the security guard worked at the local diner and had long hair. Beck Du Kyung walks into the diner and the guard asks him, rather rudely, why he came here. A guy in a bloody shirt lights up a cigarette and asks the security guard why he can't just walk into the diner and have a bite to eat. He also points out to the guard that he treats a regular customer badly, and if the guard doesn't change his behavior, he risks losing his business. Viewers are then shown who Beck Du Kyung was at that time. He was the executive director of Uyimagumi and the CEO of TS Financial Group.
The guard tells the guy that smoking is forbidden here, to which the guy apologizes and claims it's his habit. Beck Du Kyung points to the dead bodies on the floor and asks the guard if they are his customers. The guard orders the guy to stop before he draws more attention, but when he hears someone approach, he realizes it's too late. A group of people enter, and their leader asks if it's really Ji Nun, pointing to a pile of corpses. A man asks why Ji Nun no longer works with Ilhak and suggests that Ji Nun is just afraid of being like his boss. The audience is then shown who the man is. His name is Lee Hyungu. He is the director of Hook ILSU, which is part of the Garang group. After that, Baek Du Kyung tells Lee Hyungu that his boss doesn't cater to gangsters here. The man is immediately offended and asks if Baek Du Kyung is being obnoxious. The man then approaches the hero and asks if he has defeated their men. He also adds that the hero apparently has an extra life, and how dare he touch the hook of Hanam Dong. Then he continues his monologue, wondering where and for how much to sell Baek Du Kyung. He realizes that it's not a bad idea since Baek Du Kyung has no fear at all. Baek Du Kyung then starts speaking in Japanese and asks how it was possible to be called Hook. But the man doesn't understand him and interrogates what the hero said. Beck then says that if the man is from Hook, then he must be one-armed, and cuts off his arm with his knife.